2. The Dominion Mandate Our study of Numbers chapter 35 verses 30 to 34, Atonement for the Land, makes clear that our current approach to Scripture is spiritualized to the point of overlooking much that is important. The Bible obviously speaks to matters and areas very much neglected by the modern church. A theology for the earth is thus a necessary emphasis to restore wholeness and balance to the life of faith. We should remember, after all, that the Bible begins with God's creation of the heaven and the earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. It concludes with the recreation of heaven and earth. Revelation chapters 21 to 22. Its focus is not on man alone, but on all creation in relationship to God's covenant purpose. God's joy in his creation is set forth in his own words to Job. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job chapter 38, verses 4 to 7. There is nothing ascetic about God's attitude towards the material world. His is the joy of creation. It revels in the peacock and the ostrich. Job chapter 39, verse 13. In the wild goats. Job chapter 39, verses 1 to 4. The wild ass. Job chapter 39, verse 5. And in all his creatures. Job and his friends view this world in man-centred terms. God expresses his joy in all his creation. Man is the climax of God's creation, not the exclusive feature thereof. A God-centred view of creation will thus regard all of it in terms of God's purposes, not man's concerns. Neither a man-centred nor a, quote, nature-end-quote-centred perspective is biblical. We must be God-centred and covenant-oriented. Man's relationship to, quote, nature, end quote, is set forth in the creation or dominion mandate in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. These familiar words concerning the creation of man tell us, first, that man is created in the image of God. The Westminster Shorter Catechism question 10 asks, How did God create man? And answers, God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness and holiness, with dominion over the creatures. Genesis chapter 1 verses 27 and 28 Colossians chapter 3 verse 10, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24. The image of God is not a physical one. John chapter 4 verse 24. Its essence is in the attributes cited. We should remember that righteousness is simply an older word for justice. Man's creation in God's image places him in an exalted position in relation to all the rest of God's creation. Psalm 8. Second, thus, creation is sexual in nature. We are male and female. This is not an irrelevant nor a minor fact. All attempts to overlook this difference, as well as all efforts to exaggerate and exploit it, deprive man of an important part of his creaturely happiness. As male and female, mankind is commanded to be fruitful and multiply, to replenish, or literally to fill the earth. 
Although the Garden of Eden was a limited and enclosed area, to be a pilot project wherein man was to learn the tools and ways of dominion, the whole earth on creation, day six, teemed with vegetation, trees, animals and more. The text speaks of no limitation on the abundance of non-human creation. Rather, it speaks of the abundance of the animal creation on land and in the waters. Indeed, the creative command is to fill the waters in the seas and to be similarly plentiful on land. Genesis chapter 1 verses 20 to 22. Only with man is there a dramatic difference. At first we have only Adam, Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, and then later Eve, Genesis chapter 2 verses 21 to 25. The animals may run in herds or packs, but they have no federal head, whereas man does, either Adam, Genesis chapter 5 verses 1 to 3, or Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 45 to 49. Man is a covenant creature, and he has a corporate as well as a personal life, which in both cases is far beyond anything the rest of the material world can know, apart from its corporate involvement in man. Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 to 19. Third, man was created to exercise dominion and to subdue the earth. This is not something peripheral to man's being. It is essential to his nature. Either man will exercise a godly dominion or an evil, humanistic one. The earth was a mature creation. No concept of origins can escape that fact. If we begin with evolution, we must posit all the potentiality of the universe in the original miraculously born spark of being, and hence a remarkably mature original atom or subatomic particle. The trees were created as grown trees. Many of the fruit trees obviously had fruit to feed Adam, and Adam was born a mature man, physically. In the cultural sphere, Adam had no maturity. Naked and without tools, he had to make all the tools of living, by and for himself. To subdue the earth and to exercise dominion over it required tools, the development of a technology. Toolmaking, then and now, is an intellectual task, and a necessary one if dominion is to be exercised. No sphere for development was given to the rest of creation. This was a task reserved exclusively for man. If plants and animals were to be bred and developed into more useful forms, the task was, and still is, man's task and calling. The presence of man thus means a mandatory development, whether for good or for evil. Fourth, this development's potential is an aspect of the image of God in man. Development, of course, is sought by the humanist also, but his dream is to control his own evolution and to make himself God. The development program of humanistic man is thus a planned revolution. Covenant man does not seek to undo God's work, but to do his bidding. The development he seeks is not of a world order which seeks first the kingdom of God and his justice, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He seeks to conform himself to Christ, not to transform himself into a superman or God. Of Christ, we are told that he is the head of all principality and power, Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, or, in the words of the Berkeley Version, the head of all princedom and authority, this means that in Christ we are to claim every domain for him and as his to exercise the authority of his law word in every sphere. One such sphere is the natural world around us and the earth beneath our feet. All things must be developed in terms of his dominion mandate. The development of agriculture and of technology, of mining, horticulture and all related disciplines is a religious duty. The earth must be utilised to develop God's covenant mandate. Such a development in Christ is not destructive but constructive. 
constructive of the Covenant Society and its social implications. The artisans in the wilderness are described as being filled with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. Exodus chapter 31 verse 3 The same can be said of every man, whether in technology, agriculture or some other sphere, who advances the development of man's life and service under God.